Ash Ketchum's defeat in the Sinnoh League is often met with criticism. Many fans of the show thought that Ash deserved to finally win a championship, but in the end, he fell just short. So I decided to try and set things right. In this challenge, I'll play through the Sinnoh region under hardcore Nuzlocke rules, but can only use species of Pokemon that Ash has owned before or during his time in the Sinnoh region. Could I avenge Ash, or would I suffer the same fate that he did? Here's how I went. Immediately, I'm faced with a choice. As Ash used both a Turtwig and Chimchar, I'll need to choose which of these two to bring as my starter Pokemon. Who would you pick? Let me know in the comments below. I decided to bring Chimchar, as fire types will be hard to come by, and Infernape is an incredibly versatile Pokemon. I give it the nickname Goku, and my journey can now begin. Once I've got some Pokeballs, I'm able to get my first encounter, a Starly on Route 201. I nickname it Nova, and proceed to Jubilife City. I'm able to defeat my rival on Route 203 without too much trouble, and travel onwards to Ouroburg City. While preparing for the first gym, Chimchar evolved into Monferno, and Starly evolved into Staravia. This gave my team a much needed power boost for the upcoming gym. The leader, Rourke, is really dangerous as both of my team members are weak against rock types. I lead with Monferno and use Taunt, which prevents Geodude from setting up Stealth Rock. After dealing some reasonable damage, Geodude falls to two rock smashes. Next up is Onix, who unfortunately does manage to set up Stealth Rock. Although, as Onix used a turn setting this up, I'm able to finish it off without taking too much damage. Last is Kranidos, who hits very hard but is also frail. I was planning on switching into Staravia to let off an Intimidate, but with Stealth Rock up, I decided that it's best to stay in with Monferno. Fortunately, I managed to live a headbutt and outspeed to finish Kranidos with a second Rock Smash. It was a little scary, but that victory gives me my first badge. Back in Jubilife, Rowan and Lucas are confronted by Team Galactic but Rowan gives them a strongly worded lecture, defeating the grunts instantly. My next stop is the flowery Floroma Town, where I'll need to head on over to the Valley Windworks and take on Commander Mars of Team Galactic. Mars is notoriously difficult, as her Perugly is incredibly tough for this early on in the game. I lead with Monferno and begin chipping away at Zubat with Ember. It uses a Toxic, but thanks to my Petra Berry, this heals instantly and I can finish Zubat off without much trouble. Against Perugly, I switch into Staravia to lower its attack with Intimidate and a series of Growls. With the Kitty Cat now neutered, I'm free to switch into Monferno and fire off some super effective Rock Smashes. The only thing that can stop me is a critical hit. Whew, that was close. Monferno barely hung on, and now I'm forced to switch into Staravia, who finishes the fight with a Wing Attack. Three of the obtainable Pokemon in this run are locked behind honey trees, and since there are a few in this area, I thought that now would be a good time to slather myself in honey. I found mostly combi, but eventually I lured an Apom. I was able to catch it with only a few balls remaining, and gave Apom the nickname High Five. Next on Route 205, I'm able to add another member to the team, Weasel. It disappointingly has an attack lowering nature, but at least my team is starting to get some depth. After making my way through Route 205 and the forest, I eventually reached Eterna City. It's now time for the second gym, and its leader uses Grass-type Pokemon, so I'm feeling pretty confident with both Monferno and Staravia on deck. Gardenia's lead is a Turtwig, and can be troublesome as it knows Reflect, which would temporarily nerf my highly physical team. In response, I lead Monferno and use Taunt to prevent this from happening. A few Flame Wheels later, and Turtwig is no more. Cherim doesn't have too much offense, and it also falls at the hands of Monferno. Last is Roserade. Despite not having great coverage, it still hits incredibly hard. I land a Flame Wheel, but am worried about a crit, so switch into Staravia. I get put into crit range anyway, but fortunately, Roserade doesn't land one, and I can finish the fight with Wing Attack. With the Forest Badge now secured, my next stop is a raid on the Eterna Galactic building. I'll be taking on Commander Jupiter, who is just as dangerous as Commander Mars. Similarly, Jupiter's lead is also a Zubat, so I go with Staravia, who is able to take it down with two wing attacks. This brings out the deadly Skuntank. 
It's particularly annoying as it has Screech, Poison Gas, Smokescreen, and Night Slash, which has a high chance to crit. I could pivot Intimidates, but I'm worried about a crit, so I stay in and use Growl to lower its attack before switching into Monferno. On the switch, I do get crit, but can survive another, so I stay in and go for a Flame Wheel. I don't get a burn, but do get some small damage. I'm in crit range now, but have to take the chance and land another Flame Wheel. My accuracy is lowered, so I switch into Staravia once more, who just survives a Night Slash. Next, I switch into Apom and use Tickle on Skun Tank twice, lowering its attack and defense. I'm unsure whether a Flame Wheel from Monferno will be enough, so stay in with Apom and luckily land a cut, doing a large chunk of damage. From here, I switch into Monferno, who outspeeds and finishes the fight with Flame Wheel. I won the battle, but was very lucky to only get crit once. I easily could have lost a team member there. With my fresh new wheels, I then headed south through the bike path. Underneath the path, I'm able to catch my next encounter, Gligar. I nickname it Terrifying, based on both its typing and the fact that the thought of a flying scorpion horrifies me. She could kill you, and she knows it. Proceeding through the next few routes, I avoided as many battles as I could, as I'm pretty sure that one of the hikers here has an exploding geodude. I'm not certain, but don't want to take the chance and swiftly continue traveling until I reach Heart Home City. The next gym leader uses ghost type Pokemon, so I headed to the honey tree on Route 208. It would be really useful if I could find a Munchlax. I said it would be useful if I... It would be... Okay, I didn't find the stupidly rare Munchlax, so I'll need another strategy for Fantina. While leveling my team, Weasel evolved into Floatzel and with perfect timing, learned Crunch. Against Fantina, I lead my Floatzel and am able to crunch her Duskull into the Shadow Realm. Next is Miss Magius, so I switch into Monferno to tank a Magical Leaf, and then into Staravia as I'm expecting a Shadow Ball. But unfortunately, Fantina used Confuse Ray. I land a Wing Attack, but have taken too much damage. I have to switch and go back into Floatzel, who is able to outspeed and finish off the weakened Miss Magius. Last is Haunter, but it can't handle my hungry, hungry Floatzel's crunch, and with that, I've now got my third badge. It's time for a rematch with my rival, and his team is much more dangerous than last time. His Staravia is notoriously annoying due to its double team cheese, but I'm not having that, and shut it down with a few swifts. Staravia is able to finish Roselia, but comes very close to falling at the hands of Prinplup. I switch into Floatzel, and Prinplup gets a crit, but I survive and finish it off with a second crunch. Last is Ponyta, but Floatzel douses its flames with a few water guns. On Route 209, I'm able to find a Pikachu, but sadly, I couldn't catch it. I kept throwing balls, but it ran away crying. Oh well. The next portion of the game is about as uneventful as it gets. It's as if Game Freak said, hey, let's see how many insignificant battles we can cram in between two towns. During the onslaught, I was able to grab the Defog HM and caught a Noctowl, but unfortunately, it wasn't as shiny like Ashes. Six weeks later, I'd made it to Veilstone. I can take on the gym right away, but I'm not quite ready yet and head south onto Route 214. I'm able to find a Citrus Berry and farm a ton of these with some time traveling. I also picked up the Razor Fang, which I used to evolve Gligar into a Gliscor. I taught it Dig to give my team some ground coverage too. After leveling, I was ready to take on the fighting type gym of Veilstone City. Maylene leads with a Metatite, so I go with Staravia and take it down with a critical hit Aerial Ace. Next is Machoke, who I bring to low health, but it hits me with Rock Tomb and lowers my speed, forcing me to switch. I go into Float Cell, and fortunately, Rock Tomb misses. A Water Gun and Aqua Jet are enough to finish Machoke. Last is the dangerous Lucario. I land a Water Gun for some chip damage, but I'm in crit range, so I switch into my Gliscor. I can reasonably tank Lucario's hits and finish it off with a second dig. That gives me my fourth badge, and honestly, I'm feeling pretty good about the run so far. With my new badge secured, Lucas and I clean up some galactic grunts, and I'm able to obtain the Fly HM, which I teach to both Noctowl and Staravia. The routes to the south of Veilstone don't pose too much of a challenge, so before long, I'd made it to Pastoria City. The next gym leader specializes in water Pokemon, so I'll be getting a little extra help. 
First, I head over to the hidden entrance to the Wayward Cave. Here, I'm able to grab the Earthquake TM and catch a Gibble that I name Crunchy. At this point, I don't intend to have it in my team, but it'll be helpful in getting my next Pokemon. I level Gibble to level 24, evolving it into a Gabite. By using Repels at night in the Trophy Garden, I've got a 50% chance of encountering this little guy, Ash's long-standing partner Pokemon, Pikachu. I catch one of my own and nickname it Cheese. Get it? It's, it's a yellow mouse and... Ah, you probably won't get it. But we're not done yet. The Pikachu here have a 5% chance to hold a Light Ball, an item which doubles, yes, doubles the attack and special attack of a Pikachu. This is clearly very desirable, especially as I've decided not to evolve my Pikachu. Unfortunately, my Pikachu wasn't holding a Light Ball. However, I can teach Thief to Gliscor and continue encountering Pikachu until I find one with a Light Ball and use Thief to take it for myself. After about an hour, I eventually found one and gave it to my adorable little mouse. While leveling my team, Apom evolved into Ambipom and Staravia evolved into Staraptor, learning close combat. Also, my Gliscor learned Swords Dance, which may be useful later on. Before I get into the gym, my rival wants a rematch, but I'm able to overpower him with Cheese for a very clean victory. It's now time to take on the Pastoria Gym Leader, Crash Awake. His team is quite difficult, as Gyarados and Floatzel hit really hard, and Quagsire is pretty bulky with minimal weaknesses. I was hoping to use Pikachu here, but it's just too slow and frail to have an impact. I could evolve it into Raichu, but I decided not to take the Coward's way out. This is the Ash Run, dammit so the Lieutenant Surge approach of force feeding a Thunderstone just doesn't feel right. Wake's lead is Gyarados, so my first priority is nerfing its attack. I lead with Staraptor and get an Intimidate off. I then use Growl to nerf Gyarados even further. Floatzel can now comfortably tank Gyarados' attacks and finish it with a few crunches. Next is Wake's own Floatzel. I decided to stay in and we both use Crunch, doing a reasonable amount of damage. Wake got a defense drop, so I decided to switch into Staraptor to let off an Intimidate before pivoting into Ambipom. My plan is to use Tickle and Double Hit, however my Double Hit missed, so I had to switch once more and decided to go with Float Cell. Another switch into Staraptor, and my remaining options are limited, so I risk it and go for a fly. Fortunately, this hits, and Float Cell's lowered defense lets me finish it off. Last is a bulky Quagsire. I switch into Pikachu who survives a hit, and then into Gliscor on a Mudshot which doesn't affect me. Quagsire's limited offense lets me buff my attack with Swords Dance and finish it off with one final dig. I've got my fifth badge, but that battle was crazy. My team was on a knife's edge. I had a few unlucky defense drops and misses, but I spent a lot of that battle in crit range. Maybe I've inherited Ash's plot armor for this run. I then made my way past the Psyduck and onwards to Celestic Town. Once here, I'm able to obtain the Black Glasses and Choice Specs. At this stage, Cyrus isn't too much trouble though, and I clean him up relatively easily. For saving the town, I'm given the Surf HM, and use this to obtain the Flamethrower TM. I'm now able to travel west of Jubilife to Canalave City, where I can finally remove some useless HMs from my Pokemon. While leveling, Monferno evolved into Infernape and learned Close Combat. I also taught it Flamethrower, giving its moveset a nice upgrade. Before I can challenge the gym, I'll need to take on my rival who has a far improved team. He leads with Staraptor and begins using Double Team, but I lead with my own Staraptor and use Aerial Ace which can't miss. I take a little bit of damage, but can remove Staraptor in 3 turns. Rapidash is next, but I switch into Gliscor and take it out with a Sword Stance boosted dig. Against Empoleon, I switch into Floatzel, who can comfortably tank its attacks, but struggles to damage Empoleon. As my health gets low, I'm forced to switch around, and my plan is to use Close Combat with Staraptor to finish Empoleon. But... The rest of the fight was clean, but I'd lost my beloved Nova to a crit in the process. She had been with me since way back on Route 201, but would be put to rest in Canalave City. A moment of silence, please.
From a team composition perspective, losing Staraptor is a big blow, as she was my Intimidate user, but also a hard hitter. After licking my wounds, I had to press on though. The next gym uses Steel-type Pokemon, and I'm quite confident about the battle, but can't be too complacent after having just lost a Pokemon. Byron leads with Magneton, but my Infernape outspeeds, and finishes it with a single choice specs boosted Flamethrower. Next is Steelix, but it suffers the exact same fate. Bastiodon is last, and it has some huge defenses. Some switching allows Floatzel to land a Surf for big damage, followed by a switch into Ambipom, who nerfs Bastiodon's attack and defense with a deadly tickle. With that, one final dig from Gliscor is enough to give me the sixth badge. The next portion of the game has me rematch with Mars and Jupiter of Team Galactic, but honestly, these are mostly uneventful, so I'll be skipping them and beginning my journey to Northern Sinnoh. On the way, I was able to find a light clay and caught a snow run. After navigating the ferocious blizzard, I'd made it to Snow Point City. The next gym specializes in ice types, so I decided to bench Noctowl and bring in Snow Run, who evolved into a Glalie. I've had some close gym battles in this run, but this isn't one of them. By giving Infernape a few speed EVs and the choice specs, I can outspeed Candace's whole team and one-shot them with Flamethrower. My Infernape turned her Ice Gym into a Water Gym. You're welcome, Candace. It's incredibly free and gives me badge number 7. After watching my rival lose and doing absolutely nothing about it, I need to pursue Team Galactic. But first, I decided to go and grab my second last available encounter. After about an hour of slathering honey, I was able to find and catch a Heracross. It sadly doesn't have the Guts ability, but I can still find some use for it. After teaching my team a few new moves, it was time to begin the long climb up to Spear Pillar. Following the decimation of some grunts, my rival and I need to take on Mars and Jupiter in a double battle. This fight can be dicey, as my rival leads with a very useless Munchlax, and I can take big damage if our opponents double up on me. As they both lead Bronzor, I go with my choice specs Infernape. I intend to remove the one that knew Light Screen, but I chose wrong and the remaining Bronzor did set up Light Screen, nullifying my choice specs Infernape. I decided to stay in with Infernape and continue chipping away, eventually taking down the first Golbat and second Bronzor. This brought both of my opponent's ace Pokemon to the battlefield at the same time, which was something that I wanted to avoid. I decided to switch into Gliscor, but this is part of the fight where my rival takes over. His Munchlax falls and sends in Staraptor, which intimidates both of the opponent's Pokemon. I use Dig to try and stall, as close combat rips Perugly apart. From here, Gliscor can finish Skun Tank with Dig, and Rapidash ends the fight with a Fire Blast. It ended up clean, but that could have gone very differently. I then head into the Distortion world to pursue Cyrus and Giratina. Honestly, the upcoming Cyrus battle horrifies me, and I spent way too long trying to work out a strategy. A poorly timed critical hit could cause me to wipe, or at the very least, lose a large part of my team. I can't exaggerate just how worried I am about that man. Houndoom used Will-O-Wisp, which was unexpected, but Thunderfang wouldn't kill me without a crit anyway. Two surfs from Floatzel spells the end of Houndoom. Next is Gyarados, and I know that it's likely to go for Earthquake. If only I had a Pokemon that wasn't affected by Earthquake, who could also help deal with Gyarados' monstrous attack. I switch into Gliscor, who is immune to Earthquake, and also know that Gyarados is likely to use Ice Fang, as I am four times weak to it. I use this to switch into Pikachu, who I know will survive an Ice Fang. Static activates, but this is immaterial, as I outspeed and remove Gyarados with one Thunderbolt. Against Weavile, I switch into Ambipom and begin my setup. I use Nasty Plot and Agility before going with Baton Pass. This lets me switch into my Choice Specs Infernape while keeping Ambipom's stat buffs. From here, Cyrus's last three Pokemon are all outsped and Flamethrower is enough to finish them in one shot. I was really fortunate to make it through that fight as clean as I did, but I'll take it. I then have to face up against Giratina, but it's not too threatening as I can switch into Ambipom to nullify its ghost type attacks. With Giratina defeated, we've saved the day and can continue on to the final leg of the challenge. Once arriving in Sunny Shore City, I can immediately challenge the final gym. Volkner has lost his spark and needs a strong opponent to reignite his passion. You want strong? You got it, pal. I lead with Ambipom and use Agility. 
On the next turn, I baton pass into Gliscor. Jolteon can't do much against Gliscor, and I'm free to set up a Swords Dance. With my boosted attack and speed, I can easily sweep Falkner's team with a few Earthquakes. How was that? Feeling inspired? You feeling good about that? It's a quick and easy fight that gives me my final badge. Next stop, the Pokemon League. But it's a tough journey to get there. Victory Road has some tough trainers, but fortunately, my team is pretty diverse and Infernape does a lot of the heavy lifting. I'd reached the end of Victory Road and one last battle stood between me and the exit. My plan was to lead with Ambipom, set up Agility, and Baton Pass to Gabite to sweep with Dragon Claw. This worked well as I removed Gibble and Gabite, but for whatever reason, I assumed that I could also one-shot a Swablu. I could not. My Gabite fell to the last Pokemon of the last trainer in Victory Road. You were so close, dammit. Before we can enter the Pokemon League, our rival demands one final battle. His lead is a Staraptor, so I send out Pikachu. I outspeed and finish it with one Thunderbolt. Next is his Snorlax, who I expect to go for an Earthquake, so I switch into Gliscor. I then pivot into Ambipom and use an Agility before Baton passing to Gliscor. From here, I use Swords Dance, followed by Earthquake. It's a two-hit kill, and Snorlax falls. Next is Empoleon, but my boosted Gliscor finishes it instantly, and Rapidash gets a similar treatment. With only Roserade and Heracross left, I switch into Infernape, who can finish the fight with two Flamethrowers. I dedicate that win to Nova. With that taken care of, the Pokemon League was all that stood between me and Ash's redemption. But I wasn't ready yet. I needed a plan of attack for the battles ahead. After leveling my team and improving my movesets, I finally had a plan for the Elite Four. First is the bug user, Aaron. Honestly, this battle is a slaughter. Infernape outspeeds his whole team, and thanks to the choice specs, can one-shot every Pokemon except for Drapion, and even then, it can't kill me even with a crit. It's risk-free and a really easy win. Bertha's team is just as exploitable. I lead Ambipom and use Nasty Plot. I then baton pass this buff to Floatzel, who is holding the choice specs. A crit on the switch would have been deadly, but Bertha wasn't lucky. From here, I outspeed and drown her whole team in a string of surfs. Quick and clean, on to the next one. My team is quite flexible, making Flint just as easy as the last two. I've taught Pikachu Light Screen and given it the Light Clay, which will extend the duration of my screens. As Flint's Houndoom only has special moves, I can set up Light Screen, switch into Gliscor, and use Sword Dance to buff my attack by two stages. From here, it's a familiar story, and I outspeed Flint's team and bury his Pokemon with Earthquake one after another. His friend Volkner was inspired by a similar battle though, so maybe Flint enjoyed it? Next up is Lucian, and this is where the Pokemon League gets a little harder. I use the same strategies I did against Flint, but once Light Screen is up, I switch into Ambipom. Things don't go as smoothly this time. I get hit with a Crit Psychic, which puts me below half health. At this point, I'm hoping to not get crit again, but Lucian decided to set up screens. This bought me enough time to set up an agility and two nasty plots. From here, I baton pass these boosts to Infernape and just fall short of finishing Mr. Mime. However, I finish it on the next turn just as Lucian's light screen fades. This clears my path to victory and my insanely boosted Infernape is able to incinerate the rest of Lucian's team with Flamethrower. That crit made things dangerous, but in the end, I made it through. Now, only one final hurdle remained. The champion, Cynthia. Cynthia's lead is a Spiritomb with four special attacks, so I stick with my Pikachu and Light Screen combo. I then pivot into Ambipom. My aim is to set up two Nasty Plots and a Sunny Day. If I can then baton pass this to Infernape, the rest of the fight should be straightforward. I finish my setup and... Oh god. I send out Infernape next, as I want to make use of the sun. A flamethrower isn't enough to finish Spiritomb, but I survive a Psychic and finish it on the next turn. Next is Milotic, and I use Solar Beam, but this doesn't kill without the stat buffs that I planned on having. Milotic uses Mirror Coat to finally take down my cherished starter Pokemon, Infernape. I then send out Pikachu in search of Vengeance, 
But since it isn't holding the light ball, Thunderbolt just doesn't do enough, and Pikachu also falls. I'm confident that Cynthia will heal, so I send out Heracross and use Close Combat. It doesn't kill, but since I outspeed, I can finish Milotic on the very next turn. Togekiss is next, and I thought about switching, but my options are limited, so I decided to stay in and went for a Stone Edge. Togekiss is faster, but missed its Air Slash, allowing me to do some decent damage. It doesn't miss on the next turn though, and Heracross falls in one shot. I had only two Pokemon left. I went with Floatzel, as I know I can outspeed, and finish Togekiss with an Ice Beam. I'm now locked into Ice Beam by choice specs, but don't mind this, as Roserade is next. I'm faster, but Roserade tanks a hit, and finishes Floatzel with an Energy Ball. It was all down to Gliscor. Things were dire, and I knew that my only chance of victory was to buff my stats with Swords Dance. I survived an Energy Ball, and finished Roserade with an Earthquake on the next turn. I had a chance. Garchomp outsped, but I just managed to live. I then used my 4 times effective, boosted Ice Fang, but fell just short. Garchomp survived, and on the next turn, the battle was over. I'd lost. The whole run had fallen to one critical hit in the very last battle. I couldn't believe it. But after the initial frustration wore off, I decided not to do another attempt. Ash Ketchum is famous for failing at the final hurdle, and for this run to end in a similar way felt all too fitting. A Nuzlocke challenge can shift on one turn. A critical hit, a misplay, or just plain bad luck. The potential for failure is everywhere, but it's failures like this that make the victories that much sweeter. In that sense, I think that this run captures that beauty of the Nuzlocke, and it's why I continue to enjoy them. Thanks for watching.